Hey guys, today we're going to be assessing some of the teachings of Richard Rohr, the founder of the Center for Action and Contemplation, and perhaps most well known for his book, The Universal Christ. Richard Rohr is getting close to 80 years of age, and he recently announced that he has a cancer diagnosis. And so since he's getting towards the end of his life, I thought it would be important to analyze his teachings and see just how biblical they are. Before we get to that, hello friends, my name is Matt. Welcome to my channel. If you could please take a second to subscribe, I would greatly appreciate it. All right, the way we're going to go about it today, we're going to be looking at four clips from Richard Rohr. After each clip, we will come back, we'll open up our Bible, and we will assess what he is saying and test it against the Word of God. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into our first clip. And to put it in one phrase, deliberately shocking, uh, Christ is not Jesus' last name. And uh, we've sort of used it that way. We've so lumped them together uh, that uh, we don't realize we're talking about two different realities. I'm not saying they don't overlap. I'm not saying they don't come together. But uh, one reason we're facing the, the real impasse that Christianity is in right now, in all of our denominational forms, is that in the first 2,000 years after what we believe is the incarnation of God in Christ, we largely were overwhelmed by Jesus and trying to figure out who he was. Ironically, that's our gospel at today's Sunday Mass this afternoon. Who do you say that I am? Uh, but there's been not a lot of recognition of the Christ. And again, as I said, we so lumped them together and we lost the massive truth. In fact, what we lost was a basis for a universal religion, a natural religion, an inclusive religion. We ended up with an overly sentimental personal religion, which is what happens when you have Jesus without Christ. Why you can make him into a white man with blue eyes. And, uh, it's, there's, there's no corrective to that kind of silliness. And again, it's nobody's fault. Consciousness is unfolding. I, I know a lot of Christians were trained to think evolution is a bad word. In my vocabulary, it's the only thing that explains very much. That we're clearly unfolding. And the second coming of Christ is you. And the second coming of Christ is still happening. It's not one event, it's the rest of history. All right, Richard Rohr's main argument in that first clip is that most of evangelical Christianity has missed it on the Christ. He says, been focusing too much on Jesus, not enough on the Christ. And in reality, the Christ is the unveiling of you. Now, how biblical is this teaching? Well, let's go to scripture and look. So we're actually going to start in the uh, passage that he referenced out of Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to look at verses 13 through 17. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So when Peter is asked that question, he says, You are the Christ. You, Jesus, you specifically, singularly, are the Christ. And how does Jesus respond to that? Does he say, no, Peter, you don't really get it. The Christ is really just the unveiling of you. It's not just about me. He says, no, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, which is Simon, son of Jonah. It's talking about Peter there. He says, no, blessed are you. That is correct. I am the Christ. Now let's look at one more passage. This is from Acts chapter 18. It's going to be verses 27 and 28. And this is going to be tell, telling us about Apollos, one of the disciples and the evangelistic efforts that he was doing. 
It says, And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Notice again, singular, the Christ was Jesus. Richard Rohr in this clip is really making some sort of like false dilemma or, or, you know, it's Jesus and the Christ are really two separate things and it's not the same thing. And, you know, Christ is not Jesus's last name, which by the way, is the straw man fallacy. No true Christian believes that Christ is Jesus's last name, just as we don't believe that Jesus is a white man with blue eyes. So he's not correctly uh, putting forth our actual positions on those matter. But he, he is trying to say that Jesus and the Christ are separate things. Friends, Christ means the anointed one, and Jesus was the anointed one sent from heaven to save his people from their sins. So he's really, really off in his understanding of what the Christ is. But let's continue to assess the rest of his teachings and see if they get more biblical from here. I know, let, let's try Ephesians, Ephesians 1.3. You were chosen in Christ from the very beginning. You were chosen in Christ. The problem is solved. There's not an apple problem to be solved later by an atonement theory. I hesitate to raise that word because I know you're going to ask me about it. But the atonement theory was a rather late creation. We Franciscans never believed it. And those of you who were raised evangelical, it's one of your four pillars you don't even realize it's, it doesn't stand the test of time, you know? It's a problem-solving technique to a problem that we created, you know what I'm And creates a, a father God who is pissed off at humanity and needs to be bought off to love us, which contradicts the nature of love. There's a lot I could focus on from that second clip, including his take on penal substitutionary atonement, but for sake of time, I'm not going to go into that one. Instead, I want to focus on his comment where he basically was saying that if you have an angry God who needs to punish for sin, then that goes against the very nature of love. Well, let's see if that is the case by looking at the Bible. So we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4. This is talking about God. It says, the rock God. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Just and upright is he. Now, I'm hoping I don't have to put up a Bible verse proving that God is love. We know that very definitively, that that is one of God's attributes. He is love. We also know that God is just. He is righteous. And friends, we don't need to, again, make this sort of distinction and this false dilemma like you have to either be loving or you have to be just. You, you can't be both. Friends, if you want to be loving, truly, you have to be just. If God is going to love righteousness and love everything that is good, then he also has to hate everything that is unjust and unrighteous, things such as sin. Think about being a parent. If you are a good, loving parent, then you are going to make sure that there is a, an appropriate amount of discipline that you hand out to your children when they do wrong. And that is actually a sign that you love your children. If you never discipline your children when they sin against you or when they are, are immoral, then you don't really love your children. And so by saying that hating sin or punishing sin somehow goes against love. No, that actually fits in very correctly with a biblical understanding of what love is. Let's look at one more verse. This is Psalm chapter 7 and verse 11. It says, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. God feels indignation and anger towards all sorts of injustice and unrighteousness. And again, that is appropriate. So when Richard Rohr says that, well, God can't be this way, he can't do this sort of thing, he is rejecting God's revelation of who he is from scripture. And therefore, that means that Richard Rohr has created his own God that is not the God of the Bible. And this is idolatry. Richard Rohr is creating a God that he is shaped in whatever image he wants to be, but it is not definitively the God of the Bible. All right, not off to a great start. Let's go ahead and get into our third clip. Real quickly, and you can bring me back to this. In general, 
The three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are about Jesus. John is about Christ. And the reason we have so misused and misinterpreted John's gospel is this is the eternal archetypal Christ talking. He can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But he's not talking about Jesus. He's talking about this mystery, this amalgam of matter and spirit, which is the way for everybody that you discover spirit in this material universe. All right, so here Richard Rohr makes the claim that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all about Jesus, and the book of John is about the Christ. And once again, he's putting Jesus and the Christ at odds against one another, like they can't coexist somehow when Jesus, in fact, is the Christ. Friends, here is what is so great about that. John, when writing his gospel in chapter 20, took the time to explain to us in very vivid detail, very clearly, why he was writing his book. Now, let's see if he's going to say, listen, everybody else was talking about Jesus, but I'm talking about the Christ, this universal understanding of the unveiling of you. Well, let's read. This is John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. It says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written for what reason? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So John was written for the same reason that the others were written, so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, not that the Christ is the unveiling of you. And somehow from there, he started talking about, you know, that's why... Uh, Jesus could say, I am the way and the truth and life because he's talking about this universal Christ sort of thing. Friends, this is John 14, verses 5 and 6. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When Richard Rohr talks about the universal Christ, he is saying this is a universal religion. There are many ways to God. All people can be saved. Yet Jesus very clearly says, no, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's why the book of Hebrews also says there is one mediator between God and man, and it's the man, Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, the apostles say that there is no other name besides the name of Jesus given to men by which we must be saved. Once again, Richard Rohr just incredibly off. And I think people get led astray because he sounds like he's really intellectual and really spiritual and really smart. And I mean, he, he has a generally positive demeanor, I think, most of the time. But friends, I mean, he is just straight up lying about the Bible. And that is a big problem. Okay, we have one more clip to get into. Let's go ahead and jump into it. And so we understood, as the dualistic mind does, almost the entire gospel in terms of, of a win-lose paradigm. It's called a zero-sum game. In a zero-sum game, someone has to lose for you to win. That's the way you basically define your winning, is showing who the losers are, ferreting out sinners. Huh? The wonderful thing about Jesus, check me out on this, and it's almost scandalous when, when we first discover it. Jesus is not upset at sinners. He isn't. Dang it. We sure are. He's upset at people who don't think they're sinners. You check me out on that. You show me one sinner that he ever punishes. He's not into retribution. He's not into win-lose. All right, two statements we want to assess from that last clip. Number one is when he said, God isn't angry at sinners. Now, before I look at our text, which is going to be Psalm 5, 5, I would like to remind you that um, we Christians believe in the Trinity. And actually, Richard Rohr also says he believes in the Trinity. So one God existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And all of the attributes that are true about one person in the Godhead are true about one all three. So God is love. Jesus is love. Holy Spirit is love, right? So we understand that they are the same in nature and essence. So now let's look at Psalm 5, 5. Speaking of God, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evil doers. God hates all evil doers. That means Jesus. So you say he's not angry at sinners. It says he hates all 
evil doers. Now, let's look at his second comment where he said, show me one sinner that he ever punishes. Well, I immediately thought of Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts, and somebody said, well, Jesus didn't do that. Well, again, Jesus is God. Anything God does, Jesus is participating in or giving his full approval of it. But I can give you an even better text. This is Revelation chapter 6, and this is speaking of the judgment that is coming. So this is verses 15 through 17. 17. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? So on the day of judgment, when God is judging people and punishing them for their sins, notice what it says. It says it's the wrath of the Lamb. Friends, according to Scripture, who is the Lamb? It's Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb who was slain. So this is Jesus bringing his wrath against unrepentant sinners who did not put their trust in him. To summarize, guys, I, I guess you can figure it out. Uh, Richard Rohr has completely twisted and distorted the Bible and the gospel, his teachings are horrifically unbiblical. And I wanted to make this video really for two reasons. One, as I mentioned at the beginning, Richard Rohr is in poor health, and I, I, I am not celebrating that whatsoever. I really do wish him well. I hope that he makes a recovery from his cancer, but he is getting older. And so we just know that he's approaching the end of his life. And friends, if he has to stand before a holy God uh, in his current condition, it is not going to go well for him because the God that he worships does not exist. And the God of the Bible, his wrath abides on Richard Rohr still. And so if by any chance Richard Rohr were to ever see this video, I would beg and implore him to repent, to trust in the real Christ, the true Christ, the true God that has been revealed in Scripture. Otherwise, he is going to be in big trouble. Number two is for his followers. Many people listen to him. Again, um, this has kind of been a big movement, and especially in the West. A lot of people, it's, oh, I'm more spiritual than I am. You know, I, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual sort of thing. But friends, you need to understand that he basically is just making up his own teaching as you go. So people are like, well, I don't want to believe the Bible, but you, you're just going to believe a guy who just makes up stuff and he presents to you a version of God that maybe seems more likable to you. And what I want to present before you is, if that seems to be the case, well, I like the God that Richard Rohr uh, serves better than the God that, that Matt talks about. Friends, this is not how we determine who God is. It's not about what we like. God is who God is. That's why in Exodus, he says, I am that I am. We don't get to determine who God is. And so if you are serving a God that someone made up or that you made up, that is idolatry and God will judge you for that. We need to believe God's revelation that he has given to us, his trustworthy word in the scripture. Uh, and so I hope that if you have been following his teaching or have been influenced by him in any way, pray for him, pray for his soul, but turn away from his teachings, read the Bible and trust in Christ. All right, friends, that's all I have for you today. I hope this is helpful. If you could please take a second to subscribe to the channel, I would greatly appreciate it. It helps me get this content out to more people on YouTube. Thanks again for watching and until next time, God bless.